awesome, awesome God. Hallelujah. So welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to another Words of Wisdom Bible Study. Thank you so much for joining in this evening to the Bible study. Amen. So as I always do, as I encourage you to get out your sword, get out your love letter, get out your letter from your heavenly father. Regardless of whether it's an electronic device, whether it's your iPhone, your iPad, your computer, whatever your love letter is on, I ask that you would get it out. And when you get it out, get out paper and pencil or paper and pen so that you can write down what the spirit of the living God may say to you tonight. Because God is always speaking, but we're not always listening. Sometimes we're not tuned into the same frequency where God is. So tonight we want to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. We want to be in tune so that we can hear the instructions from our Heavenly Father. So as we always do, as we make the declaration to ourselves and we make the declaration to the spiritual realm, as we hold up our Bible, and if you have um, your computer that you're reading um, the scriptures on, then just touch your computer, touch your laptop. But I'm holding up my pink iPad and I'm making the declaration to myself and to the spiritual realm that this is my Bible. This is my love letter from my heavenly father. This is my love letter from my daddy. And I have what he says I have. I can do what he says I can do. Tonight I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert and my heart is receptive. Hallelujah, God. My heart is receptive and I will never be the same. Never, never, never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. To God be all glory, honor, and praise. How many of us know that when you come in contact with God's word, you should never be the same way that you were before you encounter his word because God's word has the power and it has the ability to transform you. It has the ability to save you. It has the ability to transform your mind and also to till up that heart. If you have, if your heart is hard, it has the ability to crack that heart, to till it up so that it will be able to receive his engrafted word that saves souls. So we didn't have Bible study last week, but this week we're going to be going to Romans chapter six. And I was debating on whether to do chapter 16. I'm sorry. And I was debating on whether to do chapter 16, but tonight we are going to do chapter 16. And this is the last uh, chapter in the book of Romans. This is the last chapter, our last chapter in the book of Romans. Amen. So as we've, I'm going to read a few verses of Romans chapter 16, and then I'm going to go back and expound on it. If at any time you have a question or need to say something, just hit star six and you'll be able to chime in and ask your question. So Romans chapter 16 and I am reading from the New King James Version of Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, the New King James Version. And my version goes like this. Verse 1, Romans chapter 16, New King James Version, verse 1. And this is Paul talking. And he says, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Sanchia, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia in Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Juniah, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Greet Ampelias, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, 
our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachias, my beloved. Greet Apollos, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. So the last chapter that we um, did was chapter 15 of Romans. That was our, our last complete chapter that we did. And just to do a short recap of uh, Romans chapter 15. And in Romans chapter 15, Paul was reminding us that Christ has an unselfish love. Christ loves us just as we are. His love is unselfish. He gives us his love. And he said, those who are strong in the faith, that we are to receive those who are weak in the faith. We are to bear with them. We are to bear with their infirmities. We are to bear with whatever weaknesses or frailties that they have. We are to bear with those. And those that are weak are to bear with those who are strong. Those who are stronger in the faith than what the individual is that is weak. They're also to bear with those who are strong. So Paul in uh, Romans 15, he was pleading with us to have patience and to be with one mind. He said he wants us to be with one mind and one mouth as we glorify God. That means we have to be with one accord. We have to be saying the same things. We should be believing the same thing. We should be believing that Christ is the Savior, that he is the Messiah, that he is going to come back for us. Believing and having faith and hope and trusting that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, glorifying God for all the great things that he has done and all the things that he's going to do in our life. So we're to receive one another to the glory of God because God is our maker. God is the one who has made us. He created the, us. So we're to receive one another to the glory of God. Receive the other saint. Even though they may not look like you, they may be look different than you, if they are uh, naming Jesus as their Lord and Savior, if they have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, then we are to receive them. And Paul ended that uh, chapter with a prayer that God might fill them with joy and peace and believing and that they may abound in hope with the help of the Holy Spirit. So Paul constantly is always encouraging unity in the body of Christ. So in this chapter, we know that the last chapter, so he closed with instructions, with greetings and warnings also. But in this chapter, this is going to be one of the final warnings that he's going to be given. He's going to remind us and, and warn us to look for those people that Satan uses that come into the church, that cause contentions, that cause divisions, those ones that are coming in the church to divide the church. Those are the ones that are coming as sheep and uh, as wolves in sheep clothing. So in this chapter, he's going to identify about 26 people. I believe it was 26 people, including women, that are going to be, be memorialized in this particular chapter. He's going to tell us how important these people were to him and to the ministry, to the body of Christ, how instrumental that they were um, in the beginning stages of the church. So as we go to uh, verse 1, of Romans 16. So verse one says, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Sincrea, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. So Paul is sending this recommendation in his letter. He's sending his recommendation about Phoebe, letting them know who she is, that she has she is a converted Gentile, that she is a sister in the body of Christ, that she has received Jesus as her Lord and Savior, that she is a great support to him, that she has been a great support to him, and that she's been a great support to the church. So he says, and use her, receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. So the same way you will receive me, Paul is saying, or any other saint also received her, receive her and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. So whatever she is doing in the church, he says, assist her because in this particular chapter verses, we saw that it says, who is a servant? We see that there, Paul is saying that 
Phoebe is a servant. And in this particular instance, they're using servant as deacon. So it's being translated as deacon. So she, the position that she was operating in in the church is in the position as a deacon, which means that she, um, they watched her, they monitored her, and they saw that she had the qualifications of a deacon. And then in First Timothy chapter 3, it tells us what the qualifications of a deacon is. It says that a deacon should be worthy of respect. A deacon should be sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain, not robbing the people, not um, having an agenda in order to line their own pockets. So he said they must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. And then it says of a deacon said that they must first be tested. And then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacon. So a deacon also could serve as an overseer. They're the ones that caught, that work hand in hand or side by side with maybe the pastor or the apostle. So she has proven to be that type of person, that she's proven to be faithful. She's proven to be one that could be counted as a deacon. And also it says that um, she has been a helper of many and of myself as well. So he said she's been a helper of many. So she had, she, Phoebe was essential in the business of the church. She was considered to be a financial help. She had, she was wealthy. She was considered to be wealthy. So she was a big financial help to the church as well as um, operating in the office or, or as the, with the title of a deacon. So she had proven herself. Then in uh, verse three, it says Greek Priscilla and Aquila. And also uh, another note is that it's believed that uh, Phoebe is the one who brought the letter that Paul, this letter from Paul, believed that she is the one who brought it to Rome. So then in verse three, it says Greek Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. So Paul is saying, I want you to greet Priscilla and Aquila. Remember, we talked about them in Acts. They're the tent makers. They're the husband and wife duo. They're the ones who made tents. They were of the same occupation as Paul. So these two, Priscilla and Aquila, were like missionaries because they went different places and wherever they went, they were teaching the believers. They were teaching those who uh, those who were converted to uh, Judaism or converted to Christianity. So we know that they were, they helped the believers in Corinth. They helped the, the believers in, in Ephesus. So they were going different places just teaching. And then Paul notes that they risked their own necks for his life. It doesn't tell us exactly what they did or how they risked their own life, but they almost died for Paul. For you who just joined, we in um, Romans chapter 16. And then it says, all the churches of the Gentiles. That's talking about all the churches that was not started by the Jews. So all the churches that were started by non-Jews, that's what it is referring to here when it says, all the churches of the Gentiles. So another noteworthy thing of Priscilla and Aquila, it seems that every place that they went, they opened their home to be used for church. In those days, there weren't church buildings like we have now. The churches were started in the people's homes. So Priscilla and Aquila, wherever they went, they would open up their home to have church. We were traveling down to Georgia um, last week, and I told my husband, I said, look, I said, there's a church on that side of the interstate and one on the other side. And I said, their doors are almost directly across from each other. And my personal opinion is I don't believe that God would have, would want us to have 
churches like that. It, those churches should come together. And most of the time when you see churches like that, and this is my opinion, is because somebody has split out of the other church and they began a church on their own because they didn't like maybe what was happening in the other church. Either it might have been something they might have had a legitimate reason to leave the church because of what was going on, that it was against the principles of God. And then sometimes they just leave because they couldn't get their way and they threw a temper tantrum and went and decided to start their own church. But anyway, Priscilla and Aquila would um, allow the church, church to be held in their home wherever they were. And then it tells us that Epinatus, that he is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ, which means that he was the first one to become, um, to receive salvation or receive the transformation through God's Holy Spirit in Achaia. So he was one of the first ones. That's what Paul is referring to here. He was one of the first converts in Achaia. And he was also a dear friend to Paul. So then in verse 6 of Romans chapter 16, he says, Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Adronicus and Genea, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. So we see Mary, and not sure which Mary, because Mary was such a common name, but it seems like whenever we see a Mary in the scriptures, it's like she's doing something. She's working. So this Mary, she's working hard for the saints. It said she labored much for us. So whatever this Mary was doing, it was noteworthy. It was noteworthy enough for it to be put in the scriptures so that she could be memorialized in the scriptures so that we will know that she worked hard for the saints. She wasn't just working for herself, but she was working for the saints, not to earn herself a name, but she was working because of her love for God, before her, because of her love for Christ. So then it says, Andronicus and Juniah, these are my kinsmen. So these were Jews. Whenever you see my kinsmen or my countrymen, Paul are referring to them as their Jews. And they were apparently, they were in prison. They were prisoners for the sake of the gospel. And he said, these were my fellow prisoners. So that may, led me to believe that they were in prison for the gospel's sake. And he said, Paul said, they accepted Christ a few years before I did. So they had already received Jesus as their Lord and Savior before Paul did. So he said, this is noteworthy to let you know that these people that I am uh, memorializing in my, in my letter, these people that I am giving honor to, they have done something in with the body in the body of Christ that is noteworthy that is praiseworthy because nowadays there's so many people that are doing stuff for their own selves for to get a name for themselves so that they can get a big church or or so that the limelight and the light would be on them but these people were not doing that they were doing for the sake of the gospel for the sake of bringing people into the gospel, bringing people to Jesus Christ. So then in verse 8, it says, Greet Ampelias, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. And Zacchaeus, beloved friend, my beloved friend. Greet Apollaeus, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. So Apollaeus is a much loved brother that Christ is, uh, that Paul is talking about. All these people are dear to Paul's heart. So he constantly he's naming so many people because he wants them to know he's sort of giving them giving them their flowers letting others know how a uh, big help that they were to him now these other names uh apelaeus urbanus stachias apelaeus these are common slave names so when i was studying they were saying that these names were found in um, a list of names of servants in the imperial household. So these people that he's naming, is, they could possibly have been slaves or been servants in the imperial household. So he says that 
Apollos has proved he was faithful to Christ. So he has proved to be faithful in Christ. How many people do you know that have proved to you that you've seen that have actually been faithful to Christ that did not have an arterial motive of doing whatever it is that they did for the church or for other people, that they did it because they were honoring Christ, not because they were trying to make a name for themselves. And then what I saw was household of Aristobulus. To me, that seemed to imply that Aristobulus himself may not have been converted, but those in his household had been converted, but him. Everybody, everyone else must have been converted because he said the household of Aristobulus. So then it says in um, verse 11, Herodian, he said, he is one of my family, one of my countrymen. So we know that this also is a Jew. And then he says, greet those who are of the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. So that was another indication to me that there were some people that had been converted in this house of Narcissus. And there were also people in the house that were unconverted. So he says, I am greeting those who are of the body of Christ. He says, greet those who are of the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. And he specifically says, who are in the Lord. Then in verse 12, it says, greet Trephina and Trephosa who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis who labored much in the Lord. So he's still just, and the Trephina and Trephosa, these are sisters. And I wondered if they were twins. The Bible doesn't tell us that they are, but a lot of times, at least in our day and time, when people name their twins, it seems like they name their names close together. So I was just wondering if these two might have possibly been twins. Then in verse 13, it says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. So we see he says, Greet Rufus. Rufus has been chosen in the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So Rufus seems like he has been chosen by the Lord to do the Lord's work. So Paul is saying, greet Rufus, because he's been chosen in the Lord. I don't know if Rufus might have not have been acting like he should have been, like a saint was supposed to be, but he's saying, greet him, because He's chosen in the Lord. And I guess Paul could think back when he was Saul of Tarsus, when he was going out um, imprisoning and hurting Christians. So he may have been reflecting back on, on that, that Rufus may not be acting the way that he should be acting, but he's been chosen by the Lord. And then he said, and his mother and mine. So Rufus's mother is not Paul's biological mother, but maybe she must have been his spiritual mother. So then he says, Greet Asyncritus, oh, these names, Philagon, Hermaeus, Partibus, Hermaeus, and the brethren who are with them. So he says, Greet all these people. Greet Philo Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. So he says, Greet all these people. These may have been churches that were in someone else's home. So maybe these different ones could possibly have been churches that were established in people's homes. So he's saying, greet all of these people because they have they are useful in the ministry. They have helped with the ministry. And Rufus, he is believed to be the son of Simon. Remember Simon of Cyrene? He is the one that carried the cross for Jesus. So Mark 15, 21, if you write that down, you can go back and look at, look at that. That was where they had named Rufus, and it's believed that he is the one that, that is being talked about in Mark 15, 21. Then in 16, it says, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. So in those days, greeting each other with a holy kiss was a sign of respect. It was a sign of love to kiss someone on the cheek. And that was practiced in the early churches. Not too much is done um, nowadays. 
It was because that during that time it was a symbol of love and unity among the early Christians. Nowadays, when you go to a church, you just can't walk up to someone and greet them in that in that manner because everyone that's in the church does not have um a holy motive for being there. Some of them that are in the church have an unholy motive for being there. In many of the churches now, which is sad to say, there is not unity and there is not love. People are just going to church just to say they go to church or because it's a religious thing to do or because maybe their mom or grandma or somebody um, wants them to go, has invited them to go to church. So some people just go to church reluctantly. So when I was looking at Luke chapter 7, verse 45, when Jesus reprimanded the Pharisee, and Luke 7, 45, Jesus told him, he says, you gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. So when he went into this this place, this, this home, the only one that showed him love was the one that was ceasing to kiss him, kiss his feet. So then in verse 17, it says, now I urge you, brethren, note those who call division and offenses contrary contrary to the doctrine which you learn and avoid them. So Paul is telling us, he's urging us, just like he was urging those in Rome, he's urging us, he's telling us, he said, it is important, keep your spiritual eyes and ears open. He says, watch out for those who make trouble. Watch out for those who start fights. Watch out for those who cause division. He says, keep your eye on those who work against the teaching you have received. He says, keep away from them. Keep away from those who cause division, those who divide God's people. Keep away from those who cause offenses, those who come and try to, to deceive God's people, those who are contentious. That means they're combative. They're quarrelsome. Keep away from those who are disruptive and who are conflict-ridden. That means these people like drama. They like to for drama to follow. Everywhere they go, they create drama. And these type of people can become a snare and a stumbling block to others, especially those who are weak in the faith. So Paul is warning us, he says, once these people have been identified, once you have learned about these people, once you have noted these people, once you have marked them, they are to be avoided. In Romans chapter 14, if you remember when we read uh, verse 13, it says, therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Now, this particular verse is not telling us not to judge the person, but we're to judge their actions. We're to judge their actions. We're to judge their motives. And anyone that um, puts a stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. One of the obstacles that was happening back in Paul's day was that the Jews were telling the Gentiles that they must be circumcised, the men must be circumcised in order to come to Christ. So that was a stumbling block that was placed in many of the uh, in the way of many of the Gentiles because they were telling them that you must do this in order to come to Christ. So that is considered to be a stumbling block. So as saints, we are to note those who teach anything contrary to God's word. Sometimes we'll go through uh, social media, we might flip through the TV and listen to people that are preaching, but you've got to be prayerful about what you allow into your spirit, what you allow your eyes and your ears to your eyes to see and your ears to hear. You've got to be very careful of that because some of these people are so slick. The enemy has people out here that are labeled as pastors, apostles, bishops, um, prophets, prophetess, evangelists, teachers. He's got them labeled as such, but yet they're teaching doctrines of devils and doctrines of demons. They're teaching things that's contrary to God's word. So we've got to make sure as saints that we note those who teach anything contrary to God's word. No matter what you think about them, no matter what I think about the person, we can think that that person is as good as gold. We can think that that person, we might think that that person can walk on water. 
But if that person is teaching anything contrary to God's word, we are to mark them, note them, and stay away from them. No matter what high regard you have for that person, no matter how high regard the society or the church may have for that person, we are to follow God's rules, follow God's law, follow the Holy Spirit. We follow so many rules, so many rules we follow. But then when it comes to God's word, we want to pick and choose what we want to follow in God's word and of God's word. And we, and it should not be that way. We want to follow. We follow things that we need to think about why we're following what we're following. Why are you doing what you're doing? When I was reading this, I was thinking about when we follow the rules of the land and if an animal comes to us or comes near us if there's an animal that's foaming at the mouth we put that animal down that animal is taken out of his misery if a person has some type of infectious disease that person is quarantined or isolated from anyone else if there's an animal that comes and 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 eats up another person or or takes another person's life then many times they'll go and hunt that animal so that they can destroy that animal so that he won't do it to anyone else. But then when it comes to God's word, we want to pick and choose who we want to apply his word to, which ones we want to follow. When it comes to false prophets, false teachers, fake Christians, when they come in our midst, we want to be lenient on them. We want to allow them to have a platform. We want to allow them to be able to speak. And then we have the nerve to say as people, God understands or God knows their heart. Yes, he knows their heart. He understands that they're in there and being used by Satan. And he understands that he's given us his word. He understands that he's given us power to rebuke them. He understands that he gives us the authority to take authority over all the power over everything that the enemy may throw our way. And we're being judged by what we do and what we don't do according to God's word. So then in Romans 16, verse 18, it says, For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. So Paul is letting us know, he said that those that cause division, those that cause offenses, he said, these people that start trouble, these wicked, evil people that are scheming, he said, they don't serve the Lord Jesus. They're not in the church to serve the Lord Jesus, but they're in the church to try to cause division, to cause offenses, to, to divide and conquer. That's what the enemy does. He tries to divide and conquer. So he says, for those who do such, do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, but they serve their own belly, which means they serve their own needs. They serve their own wants. And he says, by smooth words and flattering speech, we have to be very careful. People can say things in order for a person to believe a lie, there has to be some measure of truth in there in order for them to believe. With their smooth words, Paul is warning us. He said it is necessary that he warn us. He said, because these people are coming that that are coming to divide and deceive. He said, when they come to divide and cons- to uh, um, deceive, when they come with their offenses, he says, they're not going to announce themselves. They're not going to say, I'm here to deceive you. I'm here to lead you astray. They're not going to say those things. They're going to use smooth words. Their speech is going to be flattering. They're going to target those easy ones, those ones that are weak in the faith, those ones that are young in the faith. They're going to target those ones that are looking for a word. So be careful when you're looking for a word. They're going to be targeting those ones that have itchy ears. They're going to be targeting those people that are seeking after a word from the Lord. But then these people that are seeking after a word from the Lord, they can be easy prey because what they're actually seeking after is not actually a word from the Lord. They're seeking after a word that's going to cater to them, themselves. That's going to cater to 
whatever it is that they're looking for an answer for. They want it to be to line up with what they want, not lining themselves up with the word of God, but they want to the word to line up with them. And that will never happen. God's word is never going to line up to us. We have to line ourselves up with his word. So then in verse 19, it says, for your obedience has become known to all. Paul says, your obedience, your obedience and marking these people that are trying to divide the church, your obedience and, and, and marking these people and, and letting others know who these people are that are trying to divide the church. He says, your obedience has become known to all your obedience and, and staying in the scripture, your obedience and following Christ has been known, become known to all. And then he says, therefore, I am glad on your behalf. I'm glad for you. I'm glad that you are following the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad that you're not allowing people to lead you astray. He says, I'm glad on your behalf. I want you to be wise in what is good. He says, I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So he said, Paul said, I want you to be wise in what is good. He says, the things that are good. He says, I want you to know those things. I want you to be able to identify what is good. Because, see, it's easier to identify the evil and what's what's not right or what's wrong or what's sin if you know what is good. If you know what is good, you'll know what doesn't fit. You'll know what is not right. So we've got to condition our minds. And we've got to set our minds on things above. We've got to set our mind on things that pertain to Jesus, on things that pertain to heaven, on things that God approves. That's what we got to set our mind on so that we will be able to identify the evil, the wicked, the sinful, the things that are not good, the things that are not approved by God. And then he says, God, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. He's letting us know that if we as the church, if we stay on guard and watch out for these ones that are coming to deceive, these ones that are coming to bring offense, these ones that are coming to divide, he says, we're going to see God crush Satan under our feet shortly. We're going to see God crush the work of Satan. We're going to see the work of Satan be null and void. We're going to see these things if we would just do what we're supposed to do. If we'll just allow God to work through us and in us. See, Revelations 20 verses 1 through 3 tells us that Satan is going to eventually be bound. And he's going to be cast into the bottomless pit. But as we're going on in this world, every victory that God gives us, it's a preview of what's going to be happening in the future. What's going to happen in the future that Satan is going to be crushed. He's going to be placed under our feet. So the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So Paul is praying that the grace of Jesus be upon us as saints. Then he says in verse 21, he says, Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sassip. Sassipater, I think that's how you pronounce that. My countrymen, my family greet you. So Timothy was one of Paul's closest and most trusted associates. We know that he traveled with Paul, and we also know that Paul wrote First uh, and Second Timothy to him. Those letters were written to Timothy. This is the Timothy that um, Paul wrote the letters to. And Timothy also accompanied Paul on his second missionary journey. So Timothy has been very instrumental in Paul's life. And then we talks about Jason. Jason was one that hosted Paul on his first missionary journey or his first journey to Thessalonica. Then in verse 22, now it's going to tell us who actually wrote this letter. It says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. So although he wrote the letter, it is Paul's words. Paul dictated and he wrote the letter. Just like a stenographer in the court, people are talking and the stenographer is writing down or dictating what is being said. So this is what is happening. He's writing down what Paul is saying. So Paul is saying, uh, greet you in the Lord. Greet you, my Christian brothers and sisters. Then it says, Gaius in 23, my host and the host of the whole church greets you. 
Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you and quarters a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So Gaius, he says, my host, he's the one who is taking care of Paul at this time. He said the church meets in his house. He said it meets there in his house. So he's offering his home for the church to assemble. Remember, I um, refresh your memory that I told you that during those times, there wasn't churches or church buildings like we have now. The churches meet in the people's homes. The churches were meeting in the people's homes. And that's what we have done from time to time in our house. We've had church in our home. Gaius was also baptized by Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. Paul lets us know that he baptized him. And then he said, he greets you, Erastus, the man who takes care of the money for the city. That's who the treasurer is. He said, he says hello. And Quartus does also. Then verse 24 says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So Paul, this was, Paul is saying, he's praying that God's grace will be upon the people. Then his benediction is these last verses. 25 says, now to him who is able to establish you, that means grow and flourish you successfully, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation, that's the knowledge of the mystery that was kept secret from the uh, from from since the world began, but now may manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith to God alone, wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So the mystery that has that has been kept from uh, world before the world began, the mystery that he's talking about is a mystery of the Gentiles and the Jews coming together, uniting in the body of Christ. That was the mystery. But now we know that we're coming together. Then in Romans eleven twenty five, 25, it, Paul tells us, he says that he does not desire us to be ignorant of this mystery, that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So Israel has been blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Remember, we talked about that, that that could, some scholars believe that it, meaning that when the last Gentile is saved. So, Verse 27, to God alone, to God alone, wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Did I, wait a minute. Let me make sure I read that right. To God alone, to God alone, wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So we want to be wise in the scripture. We want to be wise in what God is saying. We want to make sure that we give honor to where honor is due. There's people that are in the body of Christ that have done things in the body of Christ that have not received any honor. They're going to receive, if they make it to heaven, they will receive um, their honor. But if you have the ability to give someone their flowers, to give them a thanks for what they're doing in the body of Christ, to show them some love, then I encourage you to do just that. I remember one of the churches that I was in, and I would go to the church, and it would be cold in there, and I'd wrap wrap my little baby up in the, in, and go in the church and clean the church. And I don't think to this day they knew who was going in the church cleaning the church uh, during the week before Sunday would come. I'd go and I'd clean. I'd dust the pews. The pews did not have uh, cushions on them. So I would take the furniture polish and I would wipe down every single pew because I was doing that for God's glory because I didn't want God's house, even though that place used to be a juke joint, I didn't want God's house to be looking any kind of way. I didn't want my house to be looking like that. And I definitely didn't want my heavenly father's house to be looking like that. So if there's any questions at this time, we have completed the book of Romans.